Good. All right. First of all, once again, on behalf of the National Park Service, let me welcome you to Gaysburg National Military Park. My name is Ranger Carlton Smith, and I'll be with you this afternoon talking about Brigadier General John Gibbon. Uh, General Gibbon himself was born on April 27, 1827, in the Holmesburg District of Philadelphia. At the age of 11, the family was going to move to North Carolina. And it's from North Carolina that Gibbon would be appointed to West Point in 1842. He'll graduate in, eight, in the class of 1847, are ranked number 20th in the class. Also in the class with Gibbon, it's going to be future Colonel James B. Fry, who served as the Provost Marshal General during the Civil War, and Major General Ambrose E. Burnside, who one time commanded the Army of the Potomac. Three other graduates would be here at Gettysburg along with Gibbon. Brigadier General Rowan B. Ayers will command the 2nd Division of the 5th Corps. Brigadier General Charles Griffin will command the 1st Division of the 5th Corps, and Brigadier General Thomas H. Neal will command the 3rd Brigade, 2nd Division, 6th Corps. And General Neal even has an avenue named after himself here at Gettysburg. On the other side, in the Army of Northern Virginia, you have Lieutenant General A.P. Hill commanding the 3rd Corps, and last but not least, the GOAT of the class, Major General Henry Heath, commanding a division in Hill's Corps. Given upon graduation, would be promoted to a brevet rank of second lieutenant in the 3rd Artillery. He will be sent to Mexico, but misses out on all the fighting. It's already done by the time he gets there. But he'll be in garrison in Mexico City and in Toluca. He will be promoted to the regular rank of second lieutenant in the 4th Artillery on September 13, 1847. He will serve at Fort Monroe in Virginia and Fort Brooke in Florida, where he takes part in some of the hostilities against the Seminole Indians. He will be in garrison at Ringo Barracks and Fort Brown, Texas, and promoted to first lieutenant on September 12, 1850. He had then been posted back to his alma mater at West Point, where from September 1854 to July 1857, Gibbon will serve as an assistant instructor of artillery. He'll also serve some, from September 1854 to July 1857, or excuse me, from September 1856 to August 1859 as the quartermaster for the post itself. He also serves as a member of a board to test the merits of breech loading rifles and was promoted to captain on November 2nd, 1859. Gibbon will also write the Artillerist Manual. And here it is. And don't mistake this, this is not a manual of tactics. Uh, this is a manual, I, I refer to this as a scientific approach to artillery. And just to give you an example, the first chapter is on gunpowder, almost 40 pages. <laughs> so everything you always want to know about gunpowder, you can find in here. But he also has chapters in here on rifles, projectiles, the theory of fire, the practice of fire, fuses, artillery implements, field artillery, and attack and defense of fortified places. He even has several pages in here of what to look for for a good artillery horse. And he even has illustrations of the hooves so you can examine them yourself to make sure you're getting a good horse. But one of the things they found out in the Civil War is the priority for horses was usually cavalry, supply wagons, and then artillery. So artillery usually got the cast off horses that nobody else wanted. 
And in between all this, given where Mary Frances Fanny North Mole in October of 1855. Fanny herself died in 1919. They had four children all together. Frances, Catherine, who died in 1888. John, who was born in 1861 and tragically died in 1863. And then a second John, born in 1864, who died in 1936. Given is assigned to Battery B, 4th U.S. Artillery in Utah, and the unit included First Sergeant James Stewart, who Given said was the best First Sergeant I ever had. They soon, after the Civil War breaks out, they receive orders to leave Camp Floyd, Utah Territory, and head to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, a distance of 1,200 miles and a march of almost two months. They moved from, from Utah on July 27, 1861, and arrived in Leavenworth on October 8, 74 days later. So it's a long march between those places. Now, even though there's no question of Gibbon staying loyal to the Union, his three brothers are going to serve in the Confederacy. His older brother, Laudner Gibbon, Formerly a lieutenant in the United States Navy, had resigned his naval commission in 1857. He will serve as a captain of artillery and be in charge of shore batteries at Mobile, Alabama. Dr. Robert Gibbon will serve as a surgeon with the 28th North Carolina and be the senior surgeon on Lane's brigade staff. And Captain Nicholas Biddle Gibbon was a captain of the 28th North Carolina and served on the staff of General Cadmus Wilcox as acting commissary. This along with a first cousin of theirs named Brigadier General J. Johnson Pettigrew, who will also fight here at Gettysburg. When Gibbon gets to DC, he's placed in command as chief of artillery of General McDowell's division starting on October 29, 1861. He will serve in that capacity until May 2nd, 1862, when he's promoted to a Brigadier General of Volunteers. And there's a good reason Gibbon's going to leave the artillery service at this point. He wouldn't have preferred to stay in it, but he's going to leave for one good reason. And according to Brigadier General Henry Hunt, who commanded the Union Artillery here at Gettysburg, in 1862, the War Department announced in orders that field officers of artillery were an unnecessary expense and the muster in the service forbidden. Promotion necessarily ceased, and such able artillerists as Hayes, De Russi, Getty, Gibbon, Griffin, and Ayers could only receive promotion by transfer to the infantry or the cavalry. So that's why Gibbons leaving his beloved artillery to seek high promotion. On May 7th, he's given command of an all-Western brigade, the 2nd, 6th, and 7th Wisconsin, and the 19th Indiana, constituting the 4th Brigade, 1st Division, 3rd Corps. Gibbons said, I relinquish command of the battery with very great regret, for it was in splendid condition and in the artillery service, I felt very much at home. I did not know how I should feel with the infantry. And like most regular army officers, Gibbon did not necessarily have a high opinion of volunteers. He didn't think they were going to make very good soldiers. But he quickly changed his mind once he took command of this brigade. He wrote, from the character of these, I was already impressed with the conviction that all they needed was some discipline and drill to make them first-class soldiers. Regular drills were instituted, and where the regimental commander knew nothing of the drill, I sometimes took command myself. How eagerly my explanations were listened to by both officers and men, and how intelligently 
the commands were executed. Gibbon said a lot of times all he had to do was explain and demonstrate a maneuver two or three times, and the men got it. So he was very much impressed by the intelli overall intelligence of his brigade. The first engagement for Gibbon's brigade would be at Browner's Farm on August 28, 1862, on the eve of the Battle of the Second Manassas. Gibbon spotted horses coming out of the timber, and he wasn't sure at first if it was cavalry or not. But he wrote, I was struck by the fact that the horses presented their flanks to view. My experience as an artillery officer told me at once what this meant, guns going into battery. And the first battlefield encounter at Browner's Farm is not going to be with a, a Confederate counterpart of like experience, going to battle for the first time. Gibbon's brigade going into battle for the first time is going to come up against a brigade once commanded by Stonewall Jackson. So they're now fighting the old Stonewall Brigade, one of the best led, best disciplined, and combat ready units in the Confederacy. Gibbon himself said it was a regular standoff fight during which neither side yielded a foot. My command exhibited in the highest degree the effects of discipline and drill. Officers and men standing up to their work like old soldiers. The next real battle for the brigade is going to be in less than a month. On September 14th at the Battle of South Mountain, where they constitute the, first, the 4th Brigade, 1st Division, 1st Corps. Gibbon said, I was ordered to move up the Higginsdown Turnpike with my brigade and one section of Gibbon's battery. It's Battery B, 4th U.S. Artillery, still known as Gibbon's Battery, to attack the position of the enemy in the gorge. My men steadily advanced on the enemy, posted in the woods and behind stone walls, driving them until he was reinforced by three additional regiments. Thus the fight continued until long after dark. Stuart, in this case his former first sergeant, using his guns with good effect, over the heads of our own men. My men, with their ammunition nearly exhausted, held all the ground they had taken and were late in the night relieved. There is a story that Major General George McClellan, command the Army of the Potomac, asked General Joe Hook, commanding the First Corps, whose troops were fighting against such great odds. And Hook replied, General's, General Gibbon's brigade of Western men. And McClellan then replied, they must be made of iron. Hook responded by saying, by the eternal, they are iron. After the battle, Hook went to McClellan and said, General, what do you think of my iron brigade? And that supposedly is the best account of how Gibbon's brigade got the nickname the Iron Brigade. And they're not going to be able to rest very long. On September 17th, they're involved in the Battle of Antietam. Gibbon's men have been ordered forward south along the Higginstown Turnpike, supported by one section of Gibbon's battery. They're in danger of being flanked. They're charged by Hood's division, which was handsomely repulsed. Stuart himself firing double canister. Now, James Stewart at this point, remember, had been Gibbon's first sergeant. Now, James Stewart is a captain with Gibbon's battery. And Captain Campbell, who was commanding the battery, brought up the other four guns. So they have six guns now on line. But he was severely wounded after doing that. So Stewart now is in command of the battery. And according to his statement, According to his first report, Stuart said, General Gibbon was in the battery and see the advantage which the enemy had, ordered one of the guns which was placed on the turnpike to be used against the enemy's infantry in the cornfield. General Gibbon acting both 
as cannoneer and gunner at this piece. So here's the old artillery officer not being able to pass up the chance to work with his battery one more time. Gibbon is now being offered command of the 2nd Division of the 1st Corps. So he's moving from brigade to division command. And he regretted leaving the Iron Brigade. But as he also said, he could not decline a higher command. On December 13, 1862, Gibbon's division is in the Battle of Fredericksburg. Right beside General Meade's division, of the Pennsylvania Reserves. The Corps commander this time is Major General John Fulton Reynolds. So three Pennsylvanians here fighting together. Now, according to General Reynolds, I send orders to General Gibbon to advance in connection with General Meade and carry the wood in his front. The advance was made under the fire of the enemy's batteries on his right and front, to which Gibbon's batteries replied. At the same time, Gibbon's division had crossed the railroad and entered the wood, driving back the first line of the enemy and capturing a number of prisoners. But the connection between his division and Meade's was broken. The connection was broken because the Confederates are now launching massive counterattacks and driving Meade's division back. And that's exposing Gibbon's division. General Gibbon's division was assailed in turn in the same manner and compelled to retire from the wood soon after Meade's. General Gibbon, having been wounded just before he entered the wood and obliged to leave the field, his division fell back in good order. Gibbon was hit in the wrist by what he described as a painful but not serious wound. He'll be able to return to duty to command the 2nd Division of the 2nd Corps at what's called the 2nd Battle of Fredericksburg. Now, this is in conjunction with the entire Chancellorsville campaign. So Gibbon is going to be over here with the 2nd and 6th Division under Sedgwick. Or excuse me, the 2nd and 6th Corps under John Sedgwick. The rest of the Army is going to be with Hooker here around Chancellorsville. And Gibbon himself reported at 10.30 o'clock on the night of the 2nd, I received orders from the Major General Commanding of the Army to take immediate possession of Fredericksburg. On reporting to Major General Sedgwick, the division was directed to march to the right of the town and make an attempt to turn the left of the enemy's works. It being found impracticable to turn the enemy's left which was found protected by a deep and a passport canal running along the entire front. General Cedric directed the, decided to assault the center at Marie's Heights, where the works were gallantly taken. As soon as the heights were carried, I moved by the left flank into town again under heavy artillery fire and joined in the pursuit of the enemy. The division captured a number of prisoners and afterward returned to the town, securing seven pieces of artillery abandoned by the enemy and took up position to defend the crossing of the river. By this time, Hooker has fallen back across the Rappahannock, and Lee now is coming down to take care of Sedgwick. And Sedgwick himself is going to have to fall back over the Rappahannock to the other side. Lee's going to begin his invasion of, of Pennsylvania on June 3rd, 1863. The Union Army is going to slowly start to follow. By July 1st, the, the Army's Second Corps is in Tarrytown, Maryland. When the new Army commander, George Gordon Meade, receives word that General Reynolds has been killed here at Gettysburg, he's going to request the new commander of the Second Corps, Major General Winfield Scott Hancock, to come to Gettysburg to serve as Meade's personal representative. And he also orders Hancock to turn command of the 2nd Corps over to John Gibbon. This despite the fact that Gibbon is junior 
to General John Caldwell commanding the 1st Division. So why is Meade do that? Well, first of all, Meade's authorized by the War Department to appoint anybody to position of authority, regardless of seniority. So Meade must have thought Gibbon was a better choice. It also should be pointed out that John Caldwell is not regular Army. He's a volunteer officer. And I think that might be in the back of Meade's mind as well. By the time the Second Corps arrives in Gettysburg, Hancock takes over again, and Gibbon goes back to his division command. They're going to help support the Third Corps on July 2nd, and when Hancock is ordered to go south to take command of the Third Corps, Gibbon is told to retake command of the Second Corps. Gibbon said, I directed solid shot to be thrown from our batteries over the heads of our own men and sent two regiments in support of the Third Corps. The smoke was at this time so dense that but little could be seen of the battle. I directed some of the guns to cease firing, fearing they might injure our own men or uselessly waste their ammunition. The battle, of course, long here dies out about 7.30 p.m. That sunset. It breaks out over at Culp Hill shortly after that. Once the fighting in Culp Hill starts to get reduced, General Meade will call a meeting of his senior commanders at the Widow Lysos house. And he invites John Gibbon to join, the, join in the conference. And to Gibbon, this seemed rather unusual. He said, I had never been a member of a council war before nor have I been since, and did not feel very confident that I was promptly a member of this one. But I had engaged in the discussion and found myself, General Warren being asleep, the junior member of it, which means as the junior member, according to Army protocol, if there's any questions asked, John Gibbon would be the first one to respond. And that's probably why he felt a little uncomfortable about the whole thing. But the decision was made to stay in line and await Lee's attack one more day. But Gibbon also said, before I left the house, Meade made a remark to me that surprised me a good deal, especially when I looked back upon the occurrence of the next day. Meade said to me, if Lee attacks tomorrow, it will be in your front. I asked him why he thought so, and he replied, because he has made attacks on both our flanks and failed. And if he concludes to try it again, it would be on our center. I expressed the hope that he would, and told General Meade with confidence that if he did, we would defeat him. Now, Gibbon's headquarters is going to be at the Fry Farm, just a few hundred yards below the Royal Lysus House. And he spent the night here at the Fry Farm sleeping in an army ambulance along with General Hancock and General John Newton, commanding the 1st Corps of the Army of the Potomac. On the morning of July 3rd, one of the servants uh, picked up what Gibbon described as an old, and rough, an old and tough rooster, which was prepared for the pot and made into a stew. And after some persuasion, General Meade came down and joined in that group. But as soon as he was done eating, he went back to the little license house. So given uh, Hancock and Newton are down here at the Fry Farm, talking about the situation, what they might do, things like that. When Given reported a signal gun was heard in my front, and everyone's attention was attracted. Almost instantly afterwards, the whole air above and around us was filled with bursting and screaming projectiles and the continuous thunder of the guns telling us that something serious was at hand. Now, they immediately called for the horses, and for some reason, the horses can't be found right away. So Gibbon comes running up the back slope of Cemetery Ridge, and he gets to the crest. And once he got to the crest, he said, at last I reached the brow of the hill to find myself in the most infernal pandemonium has ever been my fortune to look upon. Overall hung a heavy pair of smoke 
underneath which could be seen the rapidly moving legs of the men as they rushed to and fro between the pieces and the line of limbers, carrying forward the ammunition. And Gibbon even recalled seeing uh, Christian, some of Christian's men, an artillery show coming underneath one of Christian's limbers, striking the man behind him, and then seeing that man limping to the rear on his one good leg. So this is what Gibbon is seeing now. He's trying to take control of his division, get his men in order to meet the attack. And he goes down towards the left end of his division's line. And he tries to get that part of the division to swing out and hit the left flank of the attacking column. He, he said he was trying to do that when he felt a stinging blow apparently behind the left shoulder. I soon began to grow faint from the loss of blood, which was trickling from my left hand. Gibbon turned command of the division over to Brigadier General William Harrell and left the field. The sounds of the conflict on the hill still ringing in my ears. He was taken to a hospital and later sent to Baltimore, Maryland and arrived there on July 5th. He's going to recover his strength with the wound it's going to take a long time to heal. Gibbon reported that the bullet had ended exactly in the middle of my left arm near the shoulder and passed behind the shoulder blade, shattered the upper edge of the blade, producing the impression that the blow had come from behind. Gibbon and Baltimore is going to be tenderly cared for at the house of my wife's aunt, Mrs. Neal, who a poor lady was torn with anxiety for one of her sons serving in the rebel army, from whom she had had a visit only a few days before. For all she knew, he might now be lying dead or wounded on the battlefield of Gettysburg. Our civil war was full of such cases. We were a band of brothers fighting. Gibbon is going to be sent to Cleveland to take charge of the draft rendezvous there. But he has a case in November to return to Gettysburg for the dedication of the National Cemetery. Gibbon said, I felt an irresistible desire to be present and look once more upon the scene of battle. I listened to a part of Mr. Everett's oration, but becoming impatient to look over the field, went with a small party to my position in the battle. Near the, near the angle, and Gibbon wrote the angle in small letters, not big letters like we use today, describing to eager ears what I had witnessed there, while Lieutenant Haskell, his aide, gave us the details of his part of the scene. We then returned in time to hear Mr. Lincoln's touching address. The visit to the battlefield was exceedingly interesting. Gibbon will be reassigned to the draft rendezvous in Philadelphia, which he enjoyed a lot better because, unlike in Cleveland, he knew a lot of people in Philadelphia. So it's more socially acceptable to him than in Cleveland. He will report back to General Meade by April 12, 1864, to resume command of the 2nd Division of the 2nd Corps. And here we see General Hancock, the Corps commander, with his division commanders, all Gettysburg veterans, Francis Barlow, David Burney, and John Gibbon. On the second day of the Battle of Wilderness on May 6, Hancock and his division commanders, including Gibbon, are doing an excellent job of pushing back the Confederate forces of A.P. Hill here on Lee's right flank and threatened to completely disintegrate that flank and probably destroy Lee's army. But of course, down here, you can see General Longstreet coming to the rescue. Longstreet will push ahead and drive the Second Corps back all the way to the Brock Road, where the battle becomes a stalemate at that point. Later on, General Grant's going to move the army to Spotsylvania. And Gibbon will be involved in the battles at Spotsylvania, North Anna, 
and Cold Harbor. He'll be promoted to Major General of Volunteers on June 7, 1864, and in September will be given temporary command of the 18th Army Corps. On January 13, 1865, he's given command of the 24th Corps, Army of the James, under Major General E.O.C. Ord, who given said, I had a great respect and regard. Gibbons involved in the siege of Petersburg. On April 1st, five forces are going to fall to Union forces. The next day, meet or the next day, grand orders and advance along the entire line. Gibbons reported that every arrangement was made for an assault in the morning to cooperate with the 6th and 9th Corps on our right. The troops moved steadily and rapidly under a very heavy fire of both artillery and musketry and gained Fort Gregg to found it surrounded by a deep, wide ditch, partially filled with water, and flanked by fire from both right and left. The Indian made a most desperate resistance, and it was not until Fort Gregg was almost entirely surrounded, and our brave men had succeeded in climbing upon the parapet under the most murderous fire, that the place was finally taken by the last of several determined dashes with the bayonet. Gibbon and the 24th Corps were joined in pursuit of Lee's army to Appomattox, and he will be present at Appomattox when he hear the news of Lee's surrender. Gibbon remembered, I never before experienced a feeling and all its force of what it meant to be a citizen of America, and a great feeling of triumph was over me that now indeed had we demonstrated that America was a nation and entitled to all the consideration of one throughout the world. But this very natural feeling of triumph was restrained in the presence of our late enemies, and we took the announcement of the important event as quietly as possible under the circumstances. So proud as he was now to be an American, that America finally reached the status of a nation, He's going to temper that with the feeling of their Confederate enemies and follow General Grant's wish that there be no triumph in since given over the surrender. General Given himself would be one of three federal commissioners to work out all the details of Lee's surrender. How many troops, where are they going to come from, the ammunition, when are they going to surrender, how are they going to surrender, things of that nature. He's mustered out of volunteer service on January 15, 1866. He had served on another artillery board and actually served as a member of a board to hand out, private, to hand out brevet promotions in the regular army for the Civil War. And you can imagine service on any board like that is going to be filled with controversy. Because his people are going to be left out who feel they deserve it, and people are placed on the list who other people think didn't deserve it. So it's not an easy job for, for Gibbon. He's going to be made colonel of the 36th Infantry on July 28, 1866, and placed in command of Fort Kearney on December 1, 1866. He's transferred to the 7th Infantry in 1869. Now, usually I, I save a slide like this for the very end of the program. Uh, but there's two things about this I wanted to bring up now. One is, in the early 1900s, Pennsylvania apparently set funds aside to have five statues erected of native Pennsylvanians who fought here at Gettysburg. By 1914, only Andrew Humphreys, Alexander Hayes, and John Gary statues have been erected. General Crawford's statue would not be erected until June 25th, 1988, and Gibbon's statue would be dedicated on July 3rd, 1988. Why it took so long in between, I have no idea. But one of the things we were doing during COVID was we were trying to develop wayside exhibits for the Confederate monuments. 
because they might be troubling for some people. And someone pointed out, given Gibbons' military service after the Civil War, if you're a Native American, Gibbons' statue might be a little troubling. But you have to give Gibbon his deal. Gibbon tried to understand the Indians' point of view, more, more perhaps than other officers did. General Hancock, for example, because he was out west, didn't know anything about the Indians and didn't want to know anything about it. But Gibbon's going to try to take a more enlightened view, if you will. In an article he wrote to the Army, Navy, Army and Navy Journal, on January 1st, 1876, Gibbon stated, put yourself in his place and let the white man ask himself this question. What would I do if threatened as the Indian has been and is? Suppose a race superior to mine were to land upon the shores of this great continent, trade or cheat us out of our land foot by foot, gradually encroach upon our domain, our domain until we were finally driven a degraded, demoralized band into a small corner of the continent, were to live at all, it was necessary to steal, perhaps to do worse. Suppose that in a spirit of justice, this superior race should recognize the fact it was, it was in duty bound to place food in our mouths and blankets on our backs. What would we do in the premises? I have seen one who hates Indians as he does a snake and thinks there is no good Indian but a dead one. On having the proposition put to him in this way, grind his teeth in rage and explain, I would cut the heart out of everyone I could lay my hand on. And he would, and so we all would. But Gibbon is an army officer, and he has orders to obey. In 1876, the, the great Sioux War is going to break out. The direct cause of this was the desire of the federal government to take over the Black Hills, which the Lakota Sioux especially do not want. In the Sioux campaign in 1876, Terry will lead, or Gibbon will lead the Montana column. Alfred Terry, with Custer 7th Cavalry, will be coming out of Bismarck. And General Crook's column will come out of Fort Federal. And the odds will converge in the area of the Little Bighorn Valley. Gibbon arrives, Gibbon and Terry both actually arrived at the Bighorn two days after Custer's defeat. But they do arrive in time to help rescue Benteen and Reno and to bury the dead. Gibbon then continued east, but was unable to engage the Sioux in battle. The next year, 1877, you have the Nez Perce War breaking out. And again, this was a refusal of several bands of non-treaty Indians to give up their ancestral lands in the Pacific Northwest and moved to a reservation in Idaho. They're first going to seek refuge with the Crow Indians, and they're refused. So the next bid is to try to make their way north and reach Canada in Sydney Bull's camp. Gibbon's going to leave Fort Shaw with 161 officers and men. And on August 8, 1877, after a march of 250 miles, engaged the Nez Perce at the Big Hole Battlefield in Montana. Given attack at dawn, rushing into the village, his men fired indiscriminately at anyone. The Nez Perce returned fire. Given's horse is going to be hit, and he's going to be wounded again. Given is forced to withdraw from the Indian village, and take a defensive position where he has to return the fire. Brigadier General Oliver O. Howard finds Gibbon the next day with a rescue party. Gibbon had reported 31 killed and 38 wounded in this engagement, almost a third of his command. The Nez Perce kill was placed between 70 and 90 people, only about 30 of whom were probably warriors. 
But given again in this case, is going right to Bishop Tuttle, the Episcopal Bishop of Montana, and state, and state this. Knowing our peaceful disposition as you do, can you fancy us seated for two hours in the darkness of night within plain hearing of a parcel of crying babies and the talk of the fathers and mothers, waiting for light enough to commence a slaughter, which we knew from the nature of the case must necessarily be promiscuous. We had ample time for reflection, and I for one could not help thinking that this inhuman task was forced upon us by a system of fraud and injustice which had compelled these poor wretches to assume a hostile attitude towards the whites. So again, Gibbon doesn't like what he's doing, but he's an army officer, and he has orders to follow, and he has no choice but to carry them out as best he can. In years after this, Gibbon and Chief Joseph actually became friends, and they met at the Big Hole again in 1885. Or excuse me, 1889. Given himself was promoted to Brigadier General of the regular army in July of 1885 and commands the Department of the Columbia. In doing that, he had to find a way to maintain peace during the anti-Chinese riots in Seattle, Washington. In 1885 also, he's going to write personal recollections of the Civil War as a manuscript. For a variety of reasons not completely understood, the manuscript was not published until 1928. But the American Historical Review of January 1929 wrote, they are written in a straightforward, frank, soldierly fashion and tell only what the writer himself saw. Given retired from the army in 1891, and took up residence in his wife's hometown of Baltimore. Gibbon died in Baltimore on July 6, 1896, and is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Now, this is simply the front of the stone. And all it says is John Gibbon, Brigadier General USA, and Major General of Volunteers with his, with his birth and death day, John. The back of the stone is a little more interesting. For those who can recognize this, this is the emblem of the Iron Brigade. And underneath here it's written, the Iron Brigade wears this block of granite to the memory of a loved commander. So if you want to know what the Iron Brigade thought of John Gibbon, you just have to look at his monument. And Gibbon did recognize the value of the volunteers. He wrote at one point that discipline was not always what would be considered discipline in a European army, but the men had that which in many cases is a good substitute for it. Bravery, enthusiasm, coolness, dash, and above all, intelligence, and a good, clear understanding of the requirements of war. John Gibbon served his country in the military for 44 years, first in the artillery, a general of volunteers, commander on the Great Plains, and in Washington State, and was an officer who tried to look at things from different points of view. He was considered a good all-around officer and an excellent artillerist. In the forward of his recollections, Gibbon wrote, history will not be written in our day. When it is written, mistakes in matter of fact will be inexcusable if the historian be honest and otherwise fit for his works. Of course, in recollections, errors are to be expected. For all men being fallible, nearly all look at things from different standpoints. No one recollects anything exactly as others do. All that is claimed, therefore, for the following pages, is that therein is honestly transcribed what I heard and saw in our great Civil War. I want to thank everybody for joining me this afternoon for the talk. Uh, for those who have questions, you can stay behind and ask them. If you don't have questions and want to leave, 
feel free to leave whenever you want to. But I want to thank everybody for joining me today and for coming to the park.